said in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 22, He who endures until the end, the same shall be saved. I'm going to take that out of context. You have endured until the end. <laughs> and now deliverance is, is nigh. And we've come to the end of our, our time together, our meeting. And let me say one more time, for the last time I suppose this time around, and God willing to be some other time, but at least I'll be in your presence for one reason or another. But let me let me say right up front, I appreciate these past few days. I have to certainly express my gratitude to Todd for the invitation. I love him as much as I do anybody in the world. I'm thankful for Rhonda putting up with me. She's been very sweet for me. It's been a hard week for her for a lot of reasons. And uh, I really appreciate her allowing me to stay in the house. And you know, sometimes when I come, I have to sleep out the garage. But this time, <laughs> I have to sleep in the bedroom down the basement. So uh, I really appreciate that. And I appreciate all the good food that has been prepared and brought and enjoyed. And uh, I know it takes time prepare those things and to do such a wonderful job. I appreciate that. Let me say how much I appreciate the Burleson Church. You know, Todd and I have been friends now for over two decades, 21 years plus. And uh, through these years, we have basically shared our works in a lot of ways. In other words, we, we often discuss what's going on at Crandall, and he discusses what's going on here, and he informs me about your work, and I know that I have prayed for this congregation many, many times. I have prayed for many of you by name, and I'm so thankful that through the years I've got to know so many of you. Uh, many of you have uh, been around and experienced some of the milestones that I've gone through the past uh, 12, 15 years with uh, my marriage to Letta and the children of my old age, uh, Bell and Brooke, and you've been so kind and sweet along those lines. I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't just thank you tonight for this opportunity. More than anything else, it's, it's been my prayer, it is my prayer, that God's been glorified through this, this meeting. And it, it's my hope and prayer that all of us have been drawn near to Him, having attended and having worshipped and studied His Word and thought about these things. And if that's so, then it's, it's been a really good week. And I believe with all my heart that that's transpired. So if after all this is done, I don't see any of you uh, after tonight, let me say uh, again, thank you and God speak to you. And Lord willing, we'll cross paths again if I can help it. Have your Bibles be turned to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. I'm going to ask a few questions as you're, as you're turning over there, some, some food for thought. What would you think of a husband, a man who brags about how much he loves his wife and children, but yet he's a known philanderer, yet he's generally away from home pursuing his own personal interests? Yet he never seems to have time to go to any of his children's activities. But all the while he talks about how much he loves his family. What goes through your mind when you think about all that? How would you describe it? What emotions of any does that dredge up when you hear about such a person? Give me another example. What do you think if uh, you went to a new doctor, let's say, he comes in and let's just say he's he's grossly overweight. And again, we all understand how difficult it is not to put on weight in this time, so don't think I'm trying to attack anybody or anything like that. I feel particularly struggling in that regard. I have struggled in that regard through my life at various times. I tell people I've lost hundreds of pounds that I've lost. Because I'll lose 30 about every six months. So that's an exaggeration. But imagine that he comes in and you know, he's got a hacking cough, and he begins to belittle you because of your own physical He begins to scold you because of your diet and because you're not exercising. And basically, just makes you feel terrible, but yet, 
here he is, he's, he's grossly overweight. And then you find out that he smokes four or five packs of cigarettes a day. How'd that sit with you? What'd you think of the doctor? Imagine for a moment there's a man who professes to be a Christian. He seldom if ever assembles with God's people. Never cracks his Bible. Never prays or very seldom maybe at a meal every now and then. Never says anything to anybody about Jesus. If you were to ask the people that know him the best that he's a Christian, they, they, they might not even know, but yet if you were to ask him, is Jesus your Lord, what do you think if he said, Yes, he's my Lord. What would you think? What do you think regarding somebody who fits that description? I think you know where we're going with this, right? Let's think about our question tonight. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Luke 6, 46. Let's do this briefly. It's going to be the last time. They say that uh, repetition is the mother of learning. So maybe perhaps by just sort of thinking about some of the things we've seen this week, it will revive your memory and maybe cement some of the principles a little bit more thoroughly. When we began Sunday morning, we looked at the question that was posed by Cain when the Lord asked him, where is Abel, your brother? And you remember what he said, I do not know my brother's keeper in Genesis 4 verse 9. Of course, when we think of Abel, he was a keeper of sheep. And that word keeper really has to do with keeping of animals and things. It really doesn't have to do with relationships between human beings. And it was sarcasm on Cain's behalf. And there was no charity involved in what he said. So we look at that particular question and that word keeper Determining that really the better idea is, no, I'm not my brother's keeper, per se, at least in the way that Cain meant it, but I'm my brother's helper. I love my brother. I want to serve him and help him go to heaven, and I know that that's how we feel when we hear that expression, but maybe be a little more accurate and specific when we use I am my brother's helper. Second question that we noticed was from Acts chapter 16 and verse 30. With Paul and Silas and Philippi. There was the arrest, there was the earthquake, there's the jailer, and it, it comes before Paul and Silas realizing something very unique and special and supernatural has happened. And he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Acts 16, verse 30. And of course, he was given the answer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved in your household. So we spent some time talking about what it means to believe on Jesus. And you have to take everything the Bible says about a given subject or you'll miss the truth. As you look through the book of Acts and the rest of the scripture, you find that true, we must believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, both Lord and Christ, Acts 10, verse 36. But also we must repent of our sins and be baptized into him for the remission of our sins. And then we take other passages like Acts 8, verse 37, and Romans 10, 9, and 10, we realize that confession with the mouth is made of salvation. So believing on Jesus, calling on the name of the Lord, is, is something more than just an utterance or mental assent, but it's an action, repenting of sin, being baptized in Christ, having made the confession. Then, and I remember it tonight, the Sunday night we looked at the very serious question Jesus posed in Mark 8 verses 36 and 37. What shall a prophet of man to gain the whole world but loses his own soul and what will man be in exchange for his soul? And as we begin to wrap things up and think about the right <coughs> way, let me say one more time, there's nothing more valuable than your soul. Nothing. Your relationship with God is the most vital, important thing that you possess. And therefore, you should do whatever it takes that in place. And so we talked a little bit about how to keep the soul saved based on Mark 8, 34 to 38. It simply involves following Jesus as closely as possible. We follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. Revelation 14, 4 will arrive where he is. We'll be with him forever. So follow Jesus. That's something that I, I hope you'll continue to do all the days of your life until the Lord calls you home. Make sure you come back before. 
you to follow him every single day. In Monday night, we look at Exodus chapter 7, verse 17, the, the words of the Israelites in the wilderness when there was no water, and they began to thirst, and they said, is the Lord among us or not? Or sometimes when things go sideways in our lives, we wonder that. Is the Lord among us or not? Where are you, Lord? Why are things happening as they are? And we did our best to talk about why we do suffer and struggle in this life. There's a number of reasons. But primarily, we live in a fallen world. And therefore, there's natural disasters. There's the sins of others. There's our own sins. There's human error. There's all kinds of things uh, that lead to difficulties. And if we're faithful, the Lord's always with us. He'll never leave us or forsake us. We may leave him, but he won't leave us. And then last night, we looked at uh, Job 21 and verse 15, where the important question is asked, Who is the Almighty that we should serve him? Or what profit do we have if we pray to him? Of course, there's good reason to serve the Almighty, because that's what we were created to do. And if we miss that, we miss everything. What's the whole of man? Fear God and keep his commandments, right? Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. So that's what we've seen. And I was talking to Todd before we got started tonight. And I said, you know, after some days go by and you know, people forget, we might preach a sermon series on some of the hundreds of other questions that we find strong throughout Scripture. How shall we escape if we collect so great a salvation? Simon, do you love me more than me? I mean, it just goes on and on, doesn't it? So I hope and pray, I really do, that what we've been discussing has been helpful. I'll tell you what, it's, it's been helpful to me. And I don't say that like I'm selfish. Like, it's been helpful to me. I don't want to share what happens with you. That's not what I mean at all. But I, I've noted through the years that the one who's blessed the most when it comes to preaching and teaching is the one who does preach and teach. Because we engage in the preparation. All right, now let's look at Luke chapter 6. I want you to think about verses 17 through 49. If we had all the time in the world, uh, we would read the whole section, but we're not going to do that. <coughs> but if you notice at the very beginning of this section, it says in verse 17 regarding Jesus, he came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd of his disciples. And then as we look at this section, he goes on and he preaches a sermon. And the likelihood is, if you read it, you're going to say, that sounds a whole lot like, a whole lot like what? The Sermon on the Mount. Sometimes, when you look at Luke's account, this is referred to as the Sermon on the Plain, or like in the New King James Version, the, the Sermon on the Level Place. The Level Place. Now, now, here's what we got. I don't know about you, but have you ever wondered about why when you read Luke's account, it's very similar, but it's different than Matthew chapter 5 and 7, and, and vice versa. I wonder, is this the same sermon? Well, it could be. You know, uh, Hayes is a preacher, Todd's a preacher, I'm a preacher, maybe some other preachers in here, if I'm over which I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, as, as a preacher, I know I do this. Occasionally, I'll go somewhere else to preach, and I preach the sermon at home, and I'll take that sermon with me, I'll go preach it somewhere else. And if you heard both of them, they would be quite similar, I'm sure, but they'd be different. And so it may be the case that what we have here is Jesus preached a similar sermon twice, and therefore Luke's account is slightly different, and Matthew's is the same, and therefore we have two sermons here. Maybe so. On the other hand, it is not impossible to draw the conclusion that this sermon on the plain is the same as the Sermon on the Mount. Now, somebody might say, well, Jesus went up on a mountain. Matthew chapter 5, he's in a level place here. Well, there are level places in the mountainous region. And so some people say that it's talking about the, the same sermon. But then we ask the question, well, why so different as far as the wording is concerned? And, and this is my understanding, and, and this is something that I've missed for a long time in my Bible study, is I'm on, I'm on the right track. I think forever I thought that when you know I read uh, Peter's sermon in Acts 2 or when I read the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain, that I had before me verbatim exactly what was said, either by Peter in Acts 2 or by Jesus in Matthew 5 to 7 or here in Luke 6 
or, or maybe even reading through the book of Acts and seeing some of the other sermons, some of those by Paul, like uh, chapter 13 or uh, chapter 20 of the book of Acts, you came to realize that especially when it comes to the Sermon on the Mount, most commentators believe that what we find in it, like in Luke chapter 6, was the cliff notes, if you will, of an entire day of preaching by Jesus. In other words, when Matthew set forth the Sermon on the Mount, the record, he took the high points, he took the things that he wanted to emphasize, and he put them in his account, having uh, been there for that particular sermon. Whereas Luke, you know, he used sources and he interviewed people, and he chose his own information that he wanted to add. And so Matthew presents it his way, Luke presents it his way. There's some different wording, but yet it's the same message. It's both of these writers taking this entire day of preaching and boiling it down to what we have in Luke 6 and Matthew 5 through 7. I don't know about you, but I, I kind of like that. I didn't know that for a long, long time. But that seems to be the case. So when we come to Luke chapter 6, we might ask a question like this. Well, there's your answer. Now then, let's think about our question. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? Verse 46, which is probably the most uh, famous verse in, in Luke's account of this, this sermon. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Now, let me let me play Captain Obvious for a moment. I'll put on my cape. <laughs> it's right and good to call Jesus Lord. John 13, verse 13. You call me teacher and Lord, and you say Lord. In fact, there's no greater thing to express or profess than this. I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11, here's what I know. One day, every person who has ever lived will confess Jesus as Lord. Think about that. From the sorriest, most evil, wicked, heinous, worldly, materialistic, and carnal people to the most faithful We'll all bow the knee, we'll all confess with the tongue or the mouth that Jesus is who he is. And finally, they will receive the acknowledgement, the vindication that he deserves. I don't know about you, but I, I look forward to that day. I don't know exactly what it's going to be like, but I know this. It's, it's so vital that I confess to Jesus now as Lord. One day I will, whether I have here or not, but if I confess him now, it's going to make big difference as to what's going on when the Lord returns and I stand before him. It's right to call him Lord. Peter referred to him as both Lord and Christ in Acts chapter 2 verse 36 as we talk about a son of Lord. He's King of Kings and Lord of Lords, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 15. I like what Paul says. He's the blessed and only potentate, chieftain. He's King of Kings. Lord of Lords, Revelation 19, 16, same expression. It's good and right to call him Lord. Not only God, but every person who ever lives will call him that, but not everybody will. Matthew 7, 13, 14. It's right to call him Lord. Now then, why is it the case that some people call Jesus Lord, but they don't do what he says? Again, to you that might sound rather obvious. Let's explore some, some ideas. Uh, keep your place marked at, at Luke chapter 6 and turn with me for just a moment to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. I want to ask you tonight, I spoke to you, but I thought I'm going to ask you tonight, what sin did Jesus tend to rebuke more so than perhaps any other, and perhaps more harshly than any other? When you read about his life in, in the in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Tim Thomas was like this, like, I want to call him to answer the question. <laughs> what sin is it? The father's sin. It's the sin of hypocrisy. Hypocrite. The word hypocrite is an interesting term. And initially it meant an actor on stage, it meant to play a role. But by the time Jesus comes along, the word was translated hypocrite. And it was someone who feigns religiosity and piety, but in actuality they are insincere. And when you look at Matthew chapter 23, the Pharisees and the 
describe the world's worst hippie day. Speaking of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, when Jesus spotlighted the religious leaders of his day, one of the things he pointed out was regarding their almsgiving, regarding their praying, regarding their fasting, they were hypocrites. Why? Because they did it to receive the praise of men. You see, they had some motivations behind what they were doing, but you gave were insincere, disingenuous. And Jesus warns his disciples, don't be like the Pharisees. But have you ever noticed something that you find in the opening verses of Matthew 23, which is this stern rebuke <laughs> against these fellows, Pharisees and scribes? Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. Notice how Matthew 23 begins. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works. And here's the key. For they say and do not. The hypocrite says one thing but does another. Again, he's insincere. He is disingenuous. And there's nothing authentic about it at all. Let me ask you, does anybody play the hypocrite today among us even? Absolutely. Have you ever run into anybody who identifies with the Lord, identifies with his people, but yet outside the walls of the church house, they don't live anything like a Christian would live? And the reason they tend to identify with Jesus, identify with the church, is because in their minds it gives them some advantage. Say, what advantage might that be? Well, maybe advantage in the community, as far as prestige and influence is concerned. And, and uh, some sort of advantage even with maybe family members. It, it may get a, a spouse off uh, a person's back. We've all heard of people who are like that. Uh, they're, they're not authentic. And, and the only reason they have anything to do uh, with Christianity is because they think somehow it's going to help them in business or something else. They're playing a role, and that's, that's not a good thing. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy, Luke chapter 12 and verse 1. False teachers, the Bible says, speak lies and hypocrisy, or speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience, is seared with a hot iron, First Timothy 4. You don't want to play the hypocrite. And so, there is that need to pursue genuineness and honesty and the real deal. That's the first thing of hypocrisy. Let's think of another. Again, all these are rather obvious, but I want you to think about them from a certain standpoint. The second reason some people refer to Jesus as Lord, but yet don't do what he says, is simply because of rebellion. You know, they sort of have the, uh, the complex that Judah had in Jeremiah's day. Remember in Jeremiah chapter 6, when Jeremiah said to people of Judah, he said, uh, stand in the way and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. And you remember what they said? We will not walk in it. Now, now hear me out here for a second. So sometimes when we read about God's people, whether it's Israel united or northern Israel or Judah, and, and we read about them going into idolatry, sometimes we think that they basically turned their backs completely on Yahweh and didn't choose to serve him anymore and just pushed him aside. That's not true at all. Here's what they did. They considered themselves Yahweh's people always. Yahweh was Lord and God. But they would turn to other gods thinking that perhaps they could provide something that Yahweh wasn't providing. And that's why they rebelled. For instance, if Perhaps there was a drought. Well, who was supposed to be, at least based on the pagan philosophy, the god of rain? Well, the god of fertility. What if crops weren't growing? What if cattle weren't buried? What if they weren't having children? Well, rather than turn to Yahweh, oftentimes they would offer some sacrifices to Baal, thinking that somehow that would make things right. And so even though they would say Yahweh is Lord, they weren't doing what he said. You want to be in that group? 
But it happens. I'll give you an example of this from several years ago. My first work was at a small congregation in a farming community outside of Fort Worth. I only had about 60 people on Sunday, maybe 70 at the most, mostly older people. And as far as uh, economics were concerned, <coughs> nobody made a lot of money. And so as a young preacher, I was really struggling. And so I asked my elders, I said, look, I worked in the grocery business for a long time before. I couldn't have worked a long time. I was only about 26, 7 years old, but I thought I had. I said, I'd worked in the grocery business money. I know you guys, if you can't afford to pay me anymore, understand it'll help me out. I get some insurance. They said, I'm going to do that. Before all was said and done, I wound up becoming a receiving manager for a, a grocery chain. In other words, I was the guy at the back door that checked in everybody that came in, all the vendors, making sure they brought in what they said, and they were paid accordingly. There was one vendor I remember. He was about my age. And when I met him at the very beginning, I explained to him why I was there. And I said, you know, I'm a gospel preacher, and I, I don't preach far from here, and I preach in a small community, and we got talking. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, man, that's great. And he went on to talk about his family and how religious they were and where they went to church. And, and, and you know. But I noticed also when he would talk to the other vendors and other employees, he talked about a lot of things that, uh, man, you know, if you're a spiritually minded person who really cares about morality and what the Lord wants you to do, you wouldn't be involved in the kinds of things that he was talking about. So I walked up to him one day and I said, I want to ask you a question. Now, honestly, all I want to ask you was something about his father. And man, he just kind of stepped back real fast. He said, if you want to know if I'm saved, yes. Okay. <laughs> Touch you much? You know, I don't know, but... Uh, and I asked him politely about some of the things that, that he had talked about so much. And I could tell he was a little, a little embarrassed. And he said, you know, he said, uh, well, we all have something, and we all struggle, and, uh, you know, Jesus is Lord, and why do you call me Lord, Lord, you're not the one who I say? He was in rebellion against God. He refused to confess it on that occasion. And I always thought, at some point in his life, and that's been 25 years ago now, I was seven years old when I was working there at that back door. <laughs> okay, that's why I'm yeah. I've often hoped and prayed that maybe he came to his senses. There are a lot of people like that. They're simply in rebellion. And you know, I can think back when I was a, a young man in my late teens, and I'm so thankful that the Lord didn't allow me to perish during that period. Because if you would have asked me when I was 18, 19 years old, will you believe Jesus is Lord? I said, yes. But if you analyze my life, you think I didn't mean it. And evidently, I really meant it. You know, I wasn't going to do what I said. <coughs> Rebellion. Here's another one. Can you do what you don't know? If you don't understand something, can, can you still do it? Well, it might depend on what you're talking about. But here's, here's one of the reasons. Some people refer to Jesus as Lord, yet they, they don't do well. It falls down to, to ignorance. They simply don't know. I remember telling a guy who professed Christianity, he talked about how faithful his kids were and so forth and so on. And we were talking about an upcoming event where I was going to preach. And he said, what are you preaching on? I said, well, you know, I'm preaching on world events. He said, well, what, what, tell me about it. I said, well, I'm going to talk about, you know, the drinking lifestyle. I'm going to talk about the bar room sort of a complex that, that people get in, what goes on there, and, you know, how people get involved in various devices like drugs and, and gambling and things of that nature. I kid you not, he went to me and he said, what's all that? And, you know, I don't come again. What's wrong with that? And you know, then I tried to explain to him. I said, you know, this principle doesn't fall in line with God's word. This principle doesn't. And I tried to walk him through it. He's, it was like he never heard it in his life. And I would have thought that anybody who professed Christianity and was a church going person would at least know the morality of the Bible and what he was doing. Here's, here, here's, the, here's, the, here's the verse of scripture that you're going to. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Hosea 4 6. Now, here, here's a verse we don't ever tie to that. It's in the same book. 
It's in Hosea 13, verse 1. If I perish because of ignorance, whose fault is it? It's my fault. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And then at the end of the book, Hosea says to Israel, now, I think the King James is more accurate because it's translated as a mental voice. That is something someone does to him or herself. The new King James says, O oh, Israel, you are destroyed. The King James Version says, O oh, Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself. Ignorance is deadly when it comes to spirituality. I can't do what I don't know. I can't be a doer of the word if I don't know what the word says. And yet so many people are so ignorant of God's word, including many of our own. And, you know, sometimes we regale the, the old days, you know, the past. And maybe it wasn't as great as we, we made it out to be. But, you know, all my preaching life, I heard about the generation that came before me, the generation before them. And our people were known as walking Bibles. Just about a dozen years ago, maybe 15 years ago, I decided I would engage the Bible literacy of the congregation while I was preaching. So I made a test, about 25 questions. Came in on a Sunday morning, and I said, hey, I want to give you this test. I said, I don't want you, I don't want you to put your name on it. I'm not going to shame anybody. Just anonymous. I want you to fill it out the best you can and give it back to me. I don't want you to look at it. And it had questions like this. What are the five steps of the plan of salvation? Or uh, what, what tree did Adam and Eve eat of that caused them to be cast out? It was a very, very basic question. And I was so sad and shocked by how poorly the people I preached to did. And I blame myself to some degree. But these are some good people who by and large I thought and they seemed to know the Bible better than most and yet they, they didn't know it very well. Let me encourage you to be a Berean and study the scriptures daily like so many of us. Know the truth because if you don't know it you can't do it and ignorance can cause you to call, call Jesus Lord not be the name of Jesus. Here's the last thing in the lesson of the year. Turn to Romans chapter 7 with me. Why is it that some people call Jesus Lord but don't do the things that he said? Well, I, I don't believe the testimonies, and I'm not going to ask anybody to testify to that. But if I'm going to be honest before you tonight, I call Jesus Lord, and sometimes I don't do the things that he said. And my guess is that you call Jesus Lord, and there are times when you don't. It's not because you don't love it. It's not because you don't know what's right. It's because of the weakness of the flesh. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Matthew 26, verse 40. Wouldn't it be nice if when it came to doing right, it was simply a mental decision? It is a, it is a mental decision. I mean, we have to make a choice, right? But it's not just a mental decision. I'll give you, I'll give you an example. We love all men. We love our neighbor as ourselves, right? We're to have the spirit of Christ. What happens when you're driving down the highway and somebody speeds by you and suddenly comes over in your lane and basically puts on their brakes right in front of you so they can get off on the you know on, on the road they want they want to exit on to? How, how do you feel when that happens? You ever, you ever get mad at those people? You ever have an outburst of anger? You know, that's one of the works of the flesh, by the way. Well, why is it, knowing better, when something like that happens, you just don't think, well, you know, I don't want to do that, I'm not Because when that person pulls in front of you, your flesh, your appetites kick into gear. Your heart starts beating, right? Your heart starts breathing heavy. You feel something in your gut. You're angry. You feel something. Your flesh is, is crying out for some relief. And how can you experience that relief? By some way, showing that individual who's done such a horrible thing, the audacity to pull them from me, what you want to do is express to that individual how you feel about them. And sometimes when we make that expression, it is not Christ-like. 
But it's not just simply a matter of making a decision. The question is, do something about this. And here's what happens when you do. It really doesn't appease anybody or anything, does it? Here's what Paul said at the end of Romans 7, beginning in verse 18. He says, For I know that in me that is in my flesh nothing good dwells. For the will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will do, I do not do. But the evil I will not do that I practice. That doesn't mean that Paul never did anything good. It doesn't mean that he always practiced evil. He says, It's all in my members, in my flesh, that wars against this inward man that's been renewed. And, and sometimes in my weakness, I don't do what I know I should do. In verse 19, the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not do that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it's no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. He's not casting off responsibility. He's saying that the reason that at times I fall is because of the weakness of my flesh. It gets the best of me. Can you relate to that? He says in verse 21, I find in the law that evil is present with me. One who wills to do good, for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Now hear me out here. Have you ever found yourself struggling with a besetting sin? Something that maybe you've struggled with for years. I mean, it just dogs you. And you think you've got it whipped and that old man of sin, man, he can just raise his head up. Or maybe just sin generally. And you're praying to God and you're thinking, I don't know what to pray about this. What do you do? Have you ever felt like Paul? Verse 24, a wretched man that I am, he said. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And he said, I thank God for this Christ Jesus. Every time of the night we can move from Romans 8, it talks about the dwelling spirit of God. That <coughs> Enables us through the Word of God to grow and to live the Christian life. Transforms us into the image of, of Jesus. And here's the hope of the Christian. The inward man has been renewed. In my mind, I know what I want to do. But one day when Jesus comes, you know what's going to happen? He's going to change us. We're going to receive a new body. Somehow that body's tied to this room like a seed to a stalk. Not the same, but similar. In that new body that Paul talks about, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 to 58, we won't struggle with sin. We won't struggle with the weakness of the flesh because we'll be in a spiritual body where those struggles are once and for all over. I yearn for the day when I don't have to struggle with sin. What about you? That's why some people, including me, refer to Jesus as Lord, but don't always do the things that he says. But here's what it is. It's not about perfection. It's about direction. It's not about flawless behavior, although we pursue that. It's about faithfulness. And you can do that. I can do that. And I thank God that Jesus is Lord and he helps me. <coughs> Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not the things which I say? I hope that's been helpful tonight. Causing all of us to think about how we ought to live for our Lord and Savior. Not a Christian, the opportunity is now to obey the gospel. We come to the Lord in full faith, confess his name, and be baptized into him for the remission of sin. We'll be raised to walk in the of life, we'll be added to the church to read about the Bible and be the best of Christians. Then we set on the path to glory. And if you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, not work for it, work it out, God will work in you both the will to do for his good pleasure. And through that process, you can call Jesus Lord to do what he says. We can help you with that when you come right now. When we walk with the Lord in the light.